Hi, we're thrilled to welcome you to the Passionistas Persist Awards honoring Margaret Cho and Dane Goodall. We're sisters, Amy and Nancy Harrington, the founders of the Passionistas Project. Before we begin tonight's program, we wanted to take a moment to talk about something important that's happening right now. It's impossible to have a women's equality summit at this point in history without acknowledging the danger that women and girls in Afghanistan are facing right now. According to a spokesperson for the UN Refugee Agency, 80% of the nearly 250,000 people in Afghanistan who have been forced to flee their homes since the end of May have been women and children. A UN report released in July showed that the number of women and children killed and injured increased in May and June, coinciding with the time US and international troops began to withdraw their remaining troops from Afghanistan. Many fear that with the Taliban back in power, women will once again be denied education and employment opportunities, and that the consequences for women disobeying the Taliban's strict rules will lead to punishments that could range from beating to execution. We ask that over the course of this weekend, you take a moment to go visit the website of an organization that is working for the benefit of the women of Afghanistan. Learn more about Women for Women International, a nonprofit humanitarian organization that provides support to female survivors of war or visit the website for Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security, which seeks to promote a more stable, peaceful and just world by focusing on the important role women play in preventing conflict and building peace, growing economies and addressing global threats like climate change and violent extremism. Now for tonight's ceremony. We started the Passionistas Project to tell the stories of women who are following their passions and fighting for equality for everyone to inspire other people to do the same. The more we spoke with women for our podcast, subscription box, and the Women's Equality Summit, the more we saw a common trait in all of them. They are unstoppable. Whether they choose to use their voice to start a women-owned brand or fight for the rights of the marginalized, we found that all passionistas are resilient, compassionate, and persistent. So each year, we honor women who embody these qualities by presenting the Passionistas Persist Awards. Tonight's recipients, Margaret Cho and Dr. Jane Goodall, personify the values of the entire Passionistas community, and honoring them is the perfect way to end a weekend focused on the fight for women's equality worldwide. We'd like to start by introducing our first presenter for this evening, Selene Luna. Not only is Selene a talented comic, actor, and activist, she's also our producing partner on this summit. Selene was called a polished spitfire by the New York Times and a walking ball of comic defiance by LA Weekly. She is famous for being the voice of Tia Rosita in Disney Pixar's Academy Award winner Coco. In 2019, she took to Capitol Hill alongside U.S. Representative Maxine Waters and U.S. Senator Chuck Schumer to speak on behalf of disability rights. Selene opened for several of Margaret Cho's national tours and is the perfect person to present this year's Passionistas Persist Humanitarian Award. So please welcome Selene Luna. First, I'd like to thank Amy and Nancy Harrington for inviting me to present this year's Passionistas Persist Humanitarian Award. It feels impossible to cover the landscape of what this year's Humanitarian Award recipient has accomplished in her 30 plus year career. She is a pioneering comic amongst women and an outspoken beacon for social justice. I first met this year's Humanitarian Award recipient at her birthday party many years ago when I was invited by a mutual friend. I was already a fan, but upon meeting her, I knew she was special. And through the years, she proved me right. The 2021 Passionistas Persist Humanitarian Award is being presented to Margaret Cho. Throughout her career, she has been bold and courageous in speaking up for those who are not able to speak for themselves and to encourage others to use their voice to promote change. Margaret Cho is an uncompromising leader for equality and justice with a long history of tackling racism 
bullying and LGBTQIA plus rights long before woke existed and has always done it with grace, integrity and humility. As a trailblazing comedian, actress, musician and activist, Margaret Cho has five Grammy Award nominations and one Emmy nod for her groundbreaking work on 30 Rock. Rolling Stone Magazine named Margaret Cho one of the 50 best stand-up comics, calling her the sort of funny, sex-positive, feminist, and LGBT activist younger comics continue to look up to. Currently, you can catch her on Netflix, Good on Paper, and she's excited to get back on the road with her fresh off the bloat tour. Distinguished guest, please help me welcome the recipient of the 2021 Passionistas Persist Humanitarian Award, Margaret Cho. Thank you, thank you. This is wonderful. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna really treasure this. This is really incredible. I'm so honored and I, I love it. I love that, like, you know, this is just a it's, a, it's a really beautiful thing to have and to be acknowledged and it's really special. You know, I think that um, it's just really incredible to be um, just uh, rewarded for what I think is everybody's job is just activism, being aware, being um, an understanding that the world is really an unequal place. And when we can figure out a way to try to normalize equality. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's like really what it's all about is like normalizing equality and normalizing the fight for equality and wanting it, not being satisfied with the way things are and not being satisfied with the status quo. And so this um, award means everything. So thank you, I'm so honored. Thank you for uh, inviting us into your home. Thank and you. And, you know, your acceptance speech really uh, stri strikes a chord in what I want to talk about. Because it really is about, I don't understand why the concept of equality is so out of our grasp, you know, for so many people. Mm -hmm. And if we could just get on the, on the same page, um, I think we'd be living in a beautiful world. But maybe that's pretty idealistic. But uh, thank you, though, for taking the time to chat with us and being here with us on the second annual Passionistas Project Women's Equality Summit. Now, thank you. You know, from you, I personally have learned a lot about equality and what to do about it. So I'd like to go ahead and start this discussion because you mentored me, uh, not only as a comic, but also my activism. And I, I wanted to share about that because I do think a lot of people stand, stand to benefit from our discussion. Mm -hmm. Now, you have been called the patron saint of outsiders. And that is sincerely a quality of yours that drew me to you, even before I ever met you. Because as a disabled Mexican immigrant, I've always felt isolated and alienated from society. And so I became a performer as a way to force society to acknowledge my existence. And when you came into my life, you were the first person I'd ever met in showbiz who told me that my story was equally valid and that I also had the right to be heard as much as anyone else. So this is how you helped me in my journey to, into stand-up. So, you know, I, and I've seen you mentor a, a bunch of performers and non-performers alike. So is there someone in your life that did that for you? And what compels you to elevate the underdog and help them work it out through stand-up? Well, thank you. And um, I am really lucky because I had great mentors, people like Joan Rivers and Jerry Seinfeld and Robin Williams and Rosie O'Donnell and Whoopi Goldberg, people who always encouraged me, who were always like in the wings, just like saying, keep going, keep going. It's great. It's, it's great. Keep fighting. And, you know, your story is valuable. Your story is needed. And I, uh, I feel like it's kind of really our responsibility in comedy to mentor each other, especially 
uh, women because there's so few women in comedy. Mm-hmm. And it's like, we're also, we're also in demand because we're so busy. There's so few of us. So we rarely get to know our own community within our community. And so it's a really weird thing. It's very isolating. But um, I think as, as many opportunities that I can uh, reach out to younger comedians to help them feel supported and seen, mm-hmm. it's really valuable. And then I learn from them. Like I learn so much from young people now who are explaining to me everything that's changing in the world. You know, we have an entire generation who's grown up with the internet, yeah, which is really a different experience, you know, whereas we had newspapers and <laughs> silly putty and <laughs> what else? Yeah, we were like magazines, records, newspapers. I mean, I, re- I mean, the internet, uh, we didn't grow up with it. And I remember if, if you wanted to learn about counterculture, you had mm-hmm. to physically go out into the world mm-hmm. and find it and participate in it. There was yeah. no, um, you just had to go out and discover it on your own. There was no, there was, it was not something you could search for online. Like you would have to go to, um, I, I would go to Vermont Street and there was uh, a muck and EK, which had zines. Mm-hmm. And I would read those and I would actually correspond with some of these zine authors and um, actually write letters, write letters yeah. to um, Dan Klaus, who who was drawing eight ball at the time, um, mm-hmm. writing, uh, writing into the letters to the editor, <laughs> <laughs> things like that. Like it was just so much a very um, slow society, but we really appreciated our otherness because we only had each other. And now there's like a whole, uh, you know, a whole lot of ways to connect with people that are like-minded. And then that can be very good and it can be very difficult and negative too. But uh, if you, you find a place um, of oneness, even if, even if you feel isolated and alone. Yeah, I, I totally relate to what you're saying, being the same generation. And I think, I know I would have benefited tremendously having a community to turn to, but I then I also, but I'm conflicted because uh, being who I am, then I think I, w- I would have gotten lazy without having the need to go explore the world on my own mm-hmm. and finding my independence. Right. I think if the internet happened when we were kids, I don't know that I would be the independent person I am today. Yeah, we may not have appreciated it as much because it was all right there. Yeah. You know? Just in the ways that I notice a lot that um, Gen Z really idealized Gen X, not necessarily millennials, but Gen X in particular, because we were like before smartphones and be- before. Yeah, I mean, we're like the very last, you know generation of I guess horse buggies or we're the very we're the final analog generation and yeah. we, we should be called the analog generation generation yeah. analog generation analog because we we really um use I use a typewriter I use a typewriter to um and not even a word processor I use a typewriter for like uh letters I would use a typewriter for I had my dad's typewriter so I would use it for like writing I actually had a typewriter, um, but I I didn't have any paper for it. It was just like decor. I also have a telephone, like an old big light telephone with a, a, you know, like a rotary. The rotary. And I have no phone line. Oh, yeah. There's no way. (laughs) It's such a, it's like, I have like plugs in the wall, but it just goes to nowhere. That would be really spooky if you plugged it and you could actually call somebody from like 1992. (laughs) <laughs> that's not, that's scary. Hard for me. I'm that's scared. really scary. <laughs> Margaret, what are you passionate about? I'm really uh, passionate about equal rights and about the way that um, we are now uh, coming out of invisibility in the worlds of television and film, um, in entertainment in general, that we're now um, really uh, looking towards at least, I don't even see it nearly like as near like a level playing field, but I do see there's more inclusivity yeah. when we're talking about television and in particular. And um, 
I'm really grateful for that. I think that's really powerful and really exciting. So I'm really passionate about the way that entertainment has shifted. And um, we're looking more to be more inclusive. And that, that to me is really exciting. And that's really, um, it's great to finally sort of seem like, or feel like we're on time as opposed to way too early. Like, yeah. yes. you know, usually yeah. like we're way too early, but right now it feels like we're actually on time. So that's good. That's an excellent point. Cause I know, I mean, I certainly relate to this and I know you've heard it a million times throughout your career. It's like, America's not ready. People, oh, we can't make this show for you because people are not ready. Yeah. And now it's like, oh, finally they're ready. They're and, ready. And I, I can't believe this is happening in my lifetime. Yeah. Like, I'm still blown away. Like, I honestly never, ever thought I would see inclusive, you know, in, inclusive representation or diversity that we're seeing now in entertainment. Never, ever thought it was going to happen. Yeah. But, I think it's great. It's awesome. It's very gratifying. And it's really, I mean, it's just about time. And and so I'm looking forward to seeing what's going to happen in the future, because this actually oddly doesn't even feel like a trend either, because it's before yeah. this, we've sort of approached it and it's kind of felt like fleeting. But right now it seems like this change is here to stay. We hope anyway, especially when um, cis white straight male comedians are complaining it's like it's illegal to be white <laughs> and they get shut down so fast it's really funny because you know like saying like 2012 that kind of narrative would really be welcomed and people would be like oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so gratifying i cannot tell you it's so gratifying i'm just like i know so many like <laughs> cis white men are complaining and whining and like i'm like oh, well now you know how it feels that's yeah it. yeah it's it's not, and it's not even like they're marginalized it's not even like that at all it's yeah it, it, <laughs> all we want them to do is to share the space we're not trying to take it away yeah but they're like they're gonna put us again <laughs> <laughs> that's so uh, funny that would be awesome it's so fun. Who do we to zoo? They're, they're freaking out. They're totally freaking out. It's like so, like it's such an overreaction. And so it's really fun to uh, be able to make fun of it. And, you know, I think that we're really at an advantage of like, we have our cam, like camera phones, smartphones on us. We can record what's happening and like upload it. So we have evidence like before it was all sort of like hearsay. Yeah. Yet. And I, I find it, I find the irony around it really funny because, um, you know, it's these uh, cis white men who invented the technology for us to bust them. <laughs> there's no one doing it now. It's so like, funny. It's amazing. It's really funny. So it's really like, it's great uh, to feel um, more empowered by society and to know that we're on the way to something really good. And I'm, I'm just very like, oh, my, my cat is trying to get to this award. She's like, oh, She's which like, one is that one? This one is Sacre Coeur. She, um, I gave her some CBD and <laughs> she's like so high and oh. I, she's deaf. So when she has her CBD, sometimes I'll come up behind her and she'll go, ah! like she'll freak out and she ran under the couch. So now she's out again. Now she's, she's high. She had some, a little bit of CBD and some catnip. So she's like rolling. Oh, she's like, she's fucked up. It's like Coachella. It's like Catchella up in this house all the time. I mean, they're always like with the catnip and the silver rind. <laughs> oh my God. You're, you're going to have to go to Al-Anon. I know. At Cat-Anon. Dog-Anon. And then this is, you know, she is right. Oh, she's no, that, well, that's the queen. She's the queen. And uh, later, I am. I do want to talk about Lucia, definitely. Because, um, oh my, I'm all distracted because I just want to look at her. She's I know she's so a sweet. Baby she's with a so little sweet. chocolate chip eyes. She's so cute. Yes, she's oh, a little boba uh, eyes. Oh, she's boba. Look at her. I'm gonna drink her through a straw. Okay, I, I know a really big straw. <laughs> Um, I want to talk about feminism with you. And I feel like you're one of the very few women I can really discuss feminism with. Um, because as a brown woman with a disability, 
I have always had a difficult time identifying with feminism because although feminism is a social movement for equality, it denies the existence of people like me. I want to share just one example of what I'm talking about. Like for decades, feminists have been fighting to close the pay gap between men and women. However, the feminist equal pay movement does not even acknowledge that it is legal in this country to pay disabled workers sub minimum wage, sometimes as low as 22 cents an hour. And there are 2,000 companies in the US who take advantage of this law, Goodwill being the largest offender. And, and uh, so in addition, it is well documented that white women earn more than non-disabled women of color. So I have never heard an influential feminist leader speaking up against wage inequalities against women with disabilities or any disabled person for that matter. So this is only one of the issues that makes it really difficult for me to jump on board with a movement that does not acknowledge equality for all. Yeah. And, you know, so it, my entire life, it's been my impression that feminism is about issues that impact non-disabled white women and not women like me. And, you know, we all know that you're a leader in the feminist movement who has proven to be a voice for all women. And I can personally attest to that. But do you, as an Asian American woman, feel equally represented by feminism? No, but that's what we have to continually fight is the bias and discrimination and real blindness within our own ranks. You know, we really have a lot of problems that I think we're starting to see, you know, with um, the sense of understanding intersectionality and, and knowing how that affects us. And it's really it's it's really important because a lot of times when you're sort of part of one quote unquote minority, I hate the word minority because I think yeah. it's actually false, but it's yeah. not. Um, it, it's you know just what what the word is, but it's it's like if you're if you feel like you're oppressed, then you think you cannot possibly be an oppressor, and that's totally wrong. So mm -hmm. what we have to do is look internally to see where we are making those mistakes, where we are uh, biased, where we're discriminated. I mean, I've been disappointed probably by feminism more than anybody else. I mean, sometimes I'm disappointed also by the LGBTQ community yeah. in the way that they will treat parts of our community. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's changed, that's gotten a lot better. Mm -hmm. um, but it is like this weird thing where a lot of times we think bias is okay because we're already a member of another oppressed culture. Yeah. And I, I feel the same about uh, the gay community as well. I mean, it's just, um, but I, I guess it's just, um, it just trickles down to like, you have your community and then you've got the subculture within the community. Mm -hmm. It just feel like, it just feels like the, hierarchy just doesn't stop right and i mean i don't know do you have any ideas on how feminism could become intersectional i mean you did express like you know we got to look at ourselves and but i i just feel so um i'm very frustrated yeah, i just frustrated. don't know how to get the point across to these women who are not being inclusive they're, right. they're racist and ableist. Right. And I mean, then to continue, but to continue to just, you know, bring our story, tell our stories, bring our opinions forward. It's really, yeah. that's, that, that's the best way. Yeah. And I think also through jokes, actually, if you're making fun of it, because there's a sort of a lightheartedness that you can get to very deep, difficult subjects that are hard to address mm -hmm. with humor. So I think it's really trying to find a way to make it funny. I think that's excellent advice. So this brings me to just activism overall. And again, as a disabled person, 
I've had no choice but to become an activist in order to survive just to get what I need. And, and I personally find activism exhausting. I do not draw joy from it, like at all. I wish I didn't have to do it. And it is certainly not a sustainable way to live. I mean, just fighting every day just because you exist. Mm -hmm. you know? But I feel forced to do it because if I don't, I'll continue to be treated as subhuman. So I wanna know from you, does any of this resonate with you? And what motivates your activism? Oh, it's totally exhausting. And it's really frustrating. And it's also like, you know, throughout this pandemic, there has been so many um, hate crimes against Asian Americans that people, authorities, law enforcement continue to say, well, it's not a hate crime. We're not sure if it's a hate crime. And I'm like, why do I have to fight to be hated? Like, I don't think it's cool yeah. Yeah. to be hated. Like, it's not fun for me, yeah. you know? What? <laughs> It's like, why did that happen? You think I have nothing better to do? Yeah, it's like, it's oh, just all day? I just want to call it a hate crime because it's fun. It's trending. Like, okay. it's not, it, it, it's not comfortable and it's not, but it's, it's just the only thing we're able to do. And it's kind of like our, our role artists, also as artists, you know, we're just beholden to, this is what our art has to take the form of. And how amazing if, if we could just be secular in our thinking and it wouldn't have to go, you know, if we could just be free to be sort of objective, quote unquote, like white cis male, straight mm -hmm. perspective on mm -hmm. anything. But it's just not not possible in this lifetime. Yeah, agreed. And um, on that topic, growing up, was there anyone in your life that inspired your nonconformist spirit? Like as a little kid. Now, uh, or is it, it, or is your nonconformist spirit past trauma showing itself out of context? I think it's both. I mean, I had a lot of great role models when I was growing up because my parents, of course, owned a gay bookstore. So I had a lot of the people there um, who were activists who were fighting against AIDS, all of their friends and lovers were dying and they were trying to find a solution mm -hmm. to survive it and um, deal with the anxiety through action, which was activism, which was ACT UP, which was Queer Nation, mm -hmm. which was all these very grassroots early AIDS organizations. You know, that's really powerful that a great example was made for me um, with, with the queer community rising up and, you know, the women of the queer community, because lesbians and gays did not hang out before AIDS. Right. So AIDS really brought the entire queer community together in a way that was really profound. So it's something that I think I learned a lot from and, um, you know, I had a good start there and that was just a great jumping off point to a life in this work. That's great. I, it, it, yeah. And again, the uh, gay community did a lot for me. I, I felt like uh, during, the, you know, ACT UP and all the AIDS activism, that was like the first indication I ever got in my life to uh, not take it. Just mm -hmm. don't take it quietly. If something is not right, if something is unfair, speak up. I mean, these men were dying what they had mm -hmm. nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. And that really also put fire under my seat to right. just be like, well, I could be dead. Why am I going to be quiet about being, you know, treated like a second class citizen? Yeah. It's not, it's not okay. And we had to take up the um, work of all of the people who died. So we sort of had to kind of fill in the gaps of mm -hmm. everybody that was lost. So a lot of gay society is really like hierarchical in terms of age. Mm -hmm. And so we're actually losing like a rung of that ladder. Mm -hmm. in our generation so we had to sort of stretch across and and make more strides just because of where we were age-wise in response to what was happening with our community yeah yeah it, yeah it was a uh, it was our, our never forget they cannot mm -hmm. be forgotten mm -hmm. so i want to shift over to racism um you did touch on the anti-asian violence so i want to talk about this so you have gotten backlash for satirical impressions of Kim Young-il and Kim Young-un. 
brilliant in my book, um, both on 30 Rock <laughs> and on the 2015 Golden Globe Awards. So after those performances, non-Asian critics and people on Twitter were calling your performance racist and minstrel. The same people who criticized you did not criticize the Golden Globes for not having a single Asian presenter that same year. Yeah, it's no. really crazy. I mean, it's really yeah. like, I think it's really weird, but it, it's kind of like, it's sort of white supremacy wants to police race in the same mm -hmm. way that they police all the other aspects of society. Mm -hmm. And again, it's like, we're just doing the same thing. It's so weird. And so that's why I think that a lot of this is lapsed. Now, like we're sort of seeing everybody's kind of come to their senses like, wait, that's wrong. We can't live this way. We can't deal with these things this way. And, you know, there's no reason to react that way around that. You know, we have to have more inclusion on all aspects before we can actually call out like what is actually really racist. Racism exists in the invisibility, in the void of our our space in the conversation i mean it just blows my mind when a non-asian calls you a racist i know it's so dumb and, and it's <laughs> happened a lot through your career it's like really yeah. funny and but how, how, how do you directly respond to these critics well i don't really because i don't think that it, it it's almost like it's beneath contempt like it's kind of like oh well it's, it doesn't even deserve the dignity of a response it's sort of like so dumb mm -hmm. and also like i i really have such a aggravating troll problem like if i actually did sort of do that sort of troll fighting i would never ever stop so I kind of just sort of cancel it all out it doesn't make sense to me and I don't really pay attention to it but that's the best way to I think handle online uh presence is to not uh, give any credence to anything that you don't find valuable so th that kind of stuff I don't find valuable I think uh that was unintentional advice but it's great advice just just don't engage yeah it's just better because it's like we always like take for granted the positive reinforcement that we get on social media and then something negative appears and we just really like takes the wind out of our, out of our sails and there's no reason we should do that. Look, she's so high. Oh, she's so cute. She's having she's a like, great time. She's like high and there's catnip, there's Aww. CBD. <laughs> Where's the interpreter? Uh, she's like um, in the other room. She's like sick of it. She's like, I'm, I'm like, can't deal with you. You're high. So she's like, <laughs> She's straight edge. Hate, she's like, I hate you when you get this way. Yeah. She's straight edge. So she's in the other room. Because she's the one who broke her leg. So she has to have a little bit of CBD for her inflammation. And then um. I give her like the special injection. So this morning she had her injection and she's had her little treatment. So she's a little bit like. Well, it's for medical purposes, but we got to make sure she doesn't become an addict. I mean, it's really, um, it, she, you know. She's very good about it. She just does it on the weekends. Oh, it's Tuesday though, but it's she it's just does it after five o'clock. It's with therapy. Yeah. So, um, you know, I like many people in this country are utterly horrified and disgusted by all this anti-Asian violence in today's culture. And although I haven't seen your parents in a long time, I am often worried about their safety. Like, and and I'm. I just feel so overwhelmed and helpless, you know, mm -hmm. with the whole situation. Yeah. It's like, it's just, it's overwhelming, the violence yeah. against, you know, Asians. And it's insane. Do you have any advice or anything? Like, what can we do to combat anti-Asian hate and mis misinformation? I think it's just speaking up about it and talking about it and have it go beyond um, the... Uh, Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. You know, May it was like a very big topic because it was the month that we were supposed to talk about our heritage. But then you have to take it beyond that, you know, and and actually talk about it while it's happening and it's still happening. And you know, my parents are really resilient. They've been through a lot and they've seen a lot of racism in their time. They've been to to in this country since 1964 and they've seen so many cycles. Yeah. 
of of racism and and uh, been through a lot of it. And so they they're very resilient through it. And so their their uh, approach is very philosophical philosophical. Like Ooh, it's so it's not as bad as really not that bad. At least there's no helicopter dropping bomb. <laughs> So the, uh, the, <laughs> they've like had so many bad experiences. They came from like a war torn country. Right. So, so they're, like, they're like, this is child's play. They're like, oh, there's no B and no B. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. But it's really like they're, they're um, definitely um, more aware and much more careful about sort of where they are. And good. So, but it, it's like they're also very much like, you know, we just uh, take it as it comes. It's like, you know, these things have happened before mm-hmm. and we've seen this before. And it is like, cyclical. You know, whenever America is in crisis, our Americanness comes into question. And that's happened over and over from the gold rush to the uh, rooting out of, of Chinatowns in the 1800s to uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act to World War II with the Japanese internment camps to the Vietnam War to... Um, the turnover of the auto industry mm-hmm. when Japanese cars became more the norm to uh, the LA riots to 9-11, where huge, uh, huge numbers of the South Asian community were threatened just mm-hmm. because people were just assuming yeah. that they were somehow connected to 9-11. You know, the craziness, it's not even the same continent, but it's not even like any of those people are to, but you know, and all the people that are responsible for 9 11 died. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's like, what, what, what is that about? And then, you know, of course, um, coronavirus. Mm-hmm. It's just another emergence of that questionable Americanness idea. And it's like, it's like Trump saying, we'll build a wall to protect us from Mexico because they're all drug dealers and rapists. It's like, well, we're actually in Mexico. If you live in California, this is Mexico. Yeah, it's like we belong here. Is yeah, like, we. Do. I mean, it's like what, what are you talking about? It's like this is Mexico. <laughs> like it, my house, my house, my rules. <laughs> yeah, it's so insane. And then also, we're all living on indigenous land, so it's not as if there's ownership right. of land. There's this idea of ownership of America or this country or whatever. And it's just a very weird warped idea of nationalism and it, it's hurting us. It, it's well, it's that racist colonial mentality, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, um, you know, this country was founded on colonial ideals. So right. it will always be racist. And it's so disheartening and it's so, um, it, it, it's something that, like, I think uh, we've got to let go. That's why I hate when um, this sort of insurrection is sort of, like, based on, um, like, 1776, mm-hmm. <laughs> the Revolutionary War. And they're, like, trying to act like they're just taking over, like, they're the founding fathers again. It's, it's so insane. Yeah. It's and- but you know what, while they're doing that, if they truly are honoring uh, history, 1776, I want to see them in wigs with makeup and high heels. And lice. Yeah. And, and wooden teeth. Lice and wooden teeth. I mean, <laughs> come on. Yeah. So, so um, well, on to positive things. I've learned a lot from you, including how to be a good dog mom. And can you tell us about Lucia and Michelson Found Animals? Um, Lucia is uh, from Michelson Found Animals, which is a wonderful animal rescue. And uh, they are really, really incredible. And she came into my life. She's part of a litter that was rescued. And um, all of the puppies and the mom got adopted. They're all really cute and really sweet. And you know, she's just the best thing. She's two and a half years old. She kind of goes with me everywhere. But um, they I think animals are really important and they've really helped my life so much. And I'm so grateful for them. And, and Michelson's animals are just phenomenal with the work they do. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's a really 
it's a really great thing because animals need our help. And so this is, this is a great, great organization. They do. They really need our help. They're the most vulnerable. Animals yeah. and children, they, yeah. they, we have to protect them. Yes. And um, if anyone watching wants to learn more about Michelson Found Animals, they are one of our charitable partners. And you can find their info on the Summit website. So please check them out. Let's talk about uh, fresh off the bloat. Now, now that the world is, I guess, opening back up, um, it looks like you're going back on tour to continue your fresh off the bloat tour. So I wanted you to share with us, if you could, what inspired your current show and its title? Well, it's really about the emergence of Asian American voices in entertainment. And it's really like a um, continuation of that and, and really talking a lot also about anti-Asian hate. Um, which is something that is more of it. And that, that and for me, it's also like being gay bashed versus being Asian bashed. It's different. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's very much like really about these ideas of identity and very much like what, where does it come, come in and, and where does it, why am I continually fighting? So it's, it's fun. And it's really like changed a lot. Cause it's like, we've been sitting on it for a year and a half. We all been inside and, you know, um, I, I I feel like it, it, it's like I finally actually have a lot of gratitude to be able to go out and do shows and I've been doing more of them. Um, and it feels weird still, but it feels really good. Everybody's really excited to go out. I just want to make sure that everything is safe and that everybody in the audience is safe. And, you know, it's it's but it's really like I think um, we're coming out into a changed world, I hope with more of an awareness and, and uh, consideration for each other. I, I hope so too. That would be awesome. Is there any chance you're gonna tour this abroad? Yes, definitely. Um, I was supposed to go to uh, Australia uh, and Asia last year, and probably now we'll go next year. So we'll see. We'll see how everything goes, but you know, I, I have plans to tour for sure. I know, oh, that'd be so wonderful. Yeah. And um, just a final thought, um, you know, the right to make controversial comedy seems to be under attack over like the last several years. What advice do you have for up and coming comics? And do you have advice for audiences regarding this matter? I think it's really, it, it's an opportunity for comedians to be very, uh, skilled in putting their opinions across and putting the right words to what they're feeling because people get very triggered very easily. And, and that's good too, because I mean, cancer culture, what it's all about is really this hope to make language more equal mm -hmm. and acknowledgement that words matter and we matter. And so there's uh, just, a chance, an opportunity for us to be much more uh, finessed in what we're doing. And I, I feel like this is actually a great time for comedy if we can be able to do that. You know, a lot of comedians are really outraged and angry about cancellation culture and all that idea of cancellation, but I don't think it's um, as simple as that. I think it's actually much more of a complex journey that we need to be much more artfully aware and that's only going to be better for the art form. I agree. I love that positive outlook on this yeah. because it, it, it really puts the responsibility on the artist. Mm -hmm. Like you got to do your homework. You got to really craft it. You got to really work hard. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And still get your point across. That's yes. Awesome. I love it. Yes. It makes me feel hopeful. Yes. Cool. So is there anything that maybe um, equality, feminism wise, anything that you'd like to talk about that maybe I didn't get to? No, I'm just excited for the future. I'm excited for us to finally go back into the world. But I also do enjoy the virtual world that we have now. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a, an incredible way to communicate. And I've been able to do shows online and I love this. So I hope this continues as well. 
Me too. I love it. And I think it's uh, great. Off topic, I mean, as for disabled people, it's been like a game changer. Yeah. Because, I mean, there are so many like great, talented, uh, you know, uh, entertainers with disabilities who are now being seen and discovered where it, physically it was impossible. Um, yeah. Anyway, I love it. I hope it doesn't go away. Yeah. So I love it. Thank you so much, Margaret. Thank I you. Thank you. I love you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret and Selene, for that thought-provoking conversation. We're so grateful to you both for sharing your experiences and insight. And now we'd like to present our second award of the evening, the Passionistas Persist Icon Award. In July 1960, Jane Goodall began her landmark study of chimpanzee behavior. Her work redefined the relationship between humans and animals. In 1977, she established the Jane Goodall Institute a global leader in the effort to protect chimpanzees and their habitats. The Institute is widely recognized for innovative, community-centered conservation and development programs in Africa. In 1991, she founded Jane Goodall's Roots and Shoots, the Global Environmental and Humanitarian Youth Program. Her list of accomplishments goes on and on. Our admiration has only grown through the years as she expanded her mission to speak out about the environmental crisis and her reasons for hope that humankind will solve the problems it has imposed on the earth. As little girls, we would eagerly comb through the issues of our dad's National Geographics, hoping to see images of Dr. Goodall and eagerly await her TV appearances to hear of her experiences with chimpanzees. Dr. Goodall has never stopped being a role model and an inspiration to us and millions around the world. She continues to prove that an independent woman can follow her passions and achieve greatness which is the core message of the Passionistas Project. Dr. Goodall, on behalf of the countless people that you have inspired, it is our honor to present you with this year's Passionistas Persist Icon Award. Well, all I can say is thank you very much, and I'm greatly honored. But who we should really be honoring is the person who made me who I am. And here she is. My amazing mother, not a particularly good picture of her, but when I was 10 years old and I had read Tarzan and Dr. Doolittle, I determined I'd grow up, go to Africa, live with wild animals and write books about them. And everybody laughed. How will I do that? Africa's far away. It's dangerous. We don't know much about it. You don't have money and you're just a girl. But my mother said, if you really want to do something like this, you're going to have to work awfully hard, take advantage of all opportunities. Then if you never give up, maybe you find a way. And so, so many people, men as well as women, but especially girls, have written or said to me, you know, I want to thank you because you taught me, because you did it, I can do it too. But I take my mother's message around the world. So I'm sitting here in the home where I grew up and so many memories all around. My mother, my strong grandmother, my strong aunt, they're wonderful, wonderful role models. And so I sort of thank you in a way, honoring them at the same time. Thank you so much. Thank you, that's fabulous. And that means so much to us that you're honoring our mother because we always honor our mother as well. In fact, I'm wearing my mother's necklace and Amy has things behind her honoring our mother. So that's lovely. And that's part of why we do what we do is to honor all the women who have, who have trailblazed ahead of us and especially you. So thank you. So Dr. Goodall, what are you most passionate about? Passionate about saving this world. We've made such a mess of it. You know, here we are, the most intellectual creature that's ever walked the planet. It's the biggest difference between us and chimpanzees and other animals. And yet we're destroying our only home. And it's as though there's a disconnect between this clever brain, which can do almost everything, anything, and the human heart, where we poetically seek love and compassion. And I truly believe only when head and heart work in harmony can we attain our true human potential? We want to go back to, to those early days when you were studying the chimpanzees. 
what are some of the key things that you observed about the male female dynamic when you were out observing chimpanzees? Well, the male female dynamic is very simple. Males are dominant. They're bigger, stronger. They can afford to be more aggressive doing these majestic charging displays, hurtling across the ground, sometimes upright, shaking branches. And females, you know, their job as women throughout evolution has basically been to raise children. And if you have a little baby clinging to your breast and the, the child is dependent on the mother for up to five years, that's a long time. And so you, you cannot afford to get into these aggressive uh, situations. So there's the dominant male. They live in a, a very, you know, there's no permanent pair bonds between a male and a female. And there's a very big difference between mothers. There's good mothers and bad mothers. And not, not many really bad mothers because, you know, that would, anyway. But there's some mothers who are better than others. And the characteristics of a good mother is to be affectionate, um, allow the child some freedom and keep a firm eye in case danger threatens, and also the most important, supportive. And we can now look back over 60 years of records and see that the, the young ones who had the most supportive mothers have tended to do better. The males reached a higher position in the male hierarchy. They were more assertive, sure of themselves, probably sired more children, and the females are better mothers. So, you know, the dynamic is, is, is very simple. So now how did that, those observations impact your view of the male-female dynamic in humans? Well, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that it did. And when I think about the male-female situation, I mean, we know that women have been exploited and still are in many parts of the world. And human males also are physically typically stronger than females, which has allowed them to take up this dominant position. And, you know, the fact that the, the woman is having babies has clearly made a very clear distinction between the sexes and the role that they play in societies. But what I always come back to again and again is what a chief of one of the Latin American tribes told me. I don't remember which country it was in, it doesn't matter. He said, we see our tribe as like an eagle. And one wing is male and the other wing is female. And only when the wings are equal will our tribe fly true. How did you approach your study of the chimpanzees differently? How did you bring kind of an emotional component to what you were doing in the field? Well, you know, I mean, I never wanted to be a scientist. Girls weren't thinking about scientific careers back then. In fact, they weren't really thinking of careers at all. They were just thinking of getting married and having children, you know? Um, so I was born loving animals. And when I was a child, I spent a long time out in the garden. This is the house where I grew up watching animals. No television, none of the modern technological gadgets that young people spend so much time on now. And the other way I was learning was books. So there were these two things, immersion in nature, watching the squirrels and the birds and the insects and so on, and books. And I loved books. We had so little money. And during the war, I don't think children's books were even made. But I found a little old secondhand bookshop with a little gnome of a man who ran it. He used to get, you know, loads of books from the house that where the people had died or gone away or something. And he didn't really know where anything was. They were just piled up all over the floor in these little dusty alleyways. And I spent hours and hours in that shop and he didn't mind. I could read books there if I wanted. And so I remember finding Tarzan of the Apes. I was 10 years old. I could just afford it. I used to save up my money, my few pennies of pocket money in order 
to try and buy a book. My sister saved them up for sweets, <laughs> but she didn't have much luck there because sweets were rationed in the war. So you really couldn't buy a lot of sweets. But anyway, we were very different. And uh, so I, I, that book, I don't know what the, what the equivalent price would be now. It was one shilling and sixpence, which I don't know what that would be now, but I could just afford it. And I took that book up, my favorite tree in the garden, just out there, my beech tree, read it from cover to cover, fell passionately in love with that glorious Lord of the Jungle. And of course he married the wrong Jane. Silly man. I was very <laughs> jealous. I mean, I knew it wasn't a Tarzan, but that's when my dream began. I would go out and go to Africa and live with wild animals. But I wanted to be a naturalist. So when I arrived, I simply did the same as I'd done in the garden here on the cliffs above the sea, just waiting, watching, getting to know them, giving them names when I could identify them, describing their behavior, realizing they were different one from another. They had different personalities, just like we do. Learning how intelligent they can be, using and making tools and things like that. And also a great array of emotions, which are similar, maybe identical to some of ours, like happiness, sadness, fear, despair, anger, grief, all of these things. And as I'd never been to college, nobody told me that it wasn't scientific to think of animals like that, fortunately. I thought of animals as they really are. And it was a shock when my mentor, Louis Leakey, said I had to get a degree. I wouldn't be taken seriously otherwise. It was no time for an undergraduate degree. He got me a place in Cambridge University in England to do a PhD in ethology. I didn't even know what ethology was, which is just behavior, but study of behavior. Anyway. Um, it was a shock to be told I'd done everything wrong. You can't talk about chimpanzees with names. You should number them. You can't talk about their personality, their mind, or their emotion. Those are unique to us. In fact, it was taught at that time, and this is the early 60s, that the difference between us and all other animals was one of kind. But fortunately, when I was a child, I had a wonderful teacher. And this was one teacher who wasn't a female in my life. It was my dog, Rusty. And if you share your life in a meaningful way with any animal, dog, cat, bird, rabbit, horse, pig, I don't care. You, you, know, you know perfectly well that professors were wrong. We're not the only beings with personality, mind, and emotion. And now science is beginning to recognize that and Animals are being labeled more and more often as sentient beings. And the people who fight that are basically those who are doing very unpleasant things to animals, like in a medical research lab or in a factory farm, people who hunt and trap, you know, that sort of thing. You talked about this being your childhood dream. Can you talk briefly about what, what that little girl inside of you felt when David Graybeard approached you for the first time and you had your first interaction with him? The first time I really met David Graybeard up close, I'd already seen him using tools to fish for termites, but not too close. And um, at that time I was mostly learning about the chimpanzees using binoculars from a distance. And then when I got back from the hills one evening. My mother, you know, she came with me to start with because the authorities wouldn't let me be alone, but she'd left. And our cook said that a, a male chimpanzee had been to the camp and he'd climbed up a palm tree, an oil nut palm, to feed on the ripe nuts. And on his way down, he'd spied some bananas, which he put out for my supper, and taken them. So I thought this was very exciting. And I asked him to leave out bananas every day. As long as the tree was fruiting, David came, ate palm nuts, 
and took away bananas. So it was, I would say, about six months after that, when he now began to let me follow him through the forest, instead of just sitting and watching and letting him go his way. And I thought I'd lost him. And when I got through this tangled thicket of thorny vegetation, <clears throat> David was sitting on the ground and he was looking back. I mean, it honestly looked as though he was waiting for me. I don't know. Anyway, he, um, I went and sat near him and lying on the ground between us was a ripe red palm nut, which chimps love. So I held it out to him on my hand. He turned his face away. So I put my hand closer. He turned, he looked directly into my eyes and he reached out, he took the nut, he dropped it, but very gently squeezed my fingers. And that's how chimpanzees reassure each other. So I knew in that moment, he absolutely understood my motive in offering him the nut, even though he didn't want it. And I understood that too. And so we were communicating deeply with a way of communication that surely predates human words. And I think that moment, I don't know, it was a very, very special moment. And I think that's when I thought, well, I'm going to spend my life working with chimpanzees and for chimpanzees. You've also done so much work uh, for the environment and for people everywhere. Um, you've expressed your belief that each one of us matters, has a role to play and make a difference. So what steps do you think people can take to start to make a difference in the world? Well, everybody has a different life and a different lifestyle, but we can all think, uh, unless we're living in poverty, for example, when we go into a supermarket, what do we buy? If it's food, do we ask ourselves, when it was made, did it harm the environment? Was it coated with lots of poisonous pesticides and herbicides? Uh, is it cheap because of, because of unequal wages in other countries, child slave labor, sweatshops? And uh, was it cruel to animals, like in a factory farm? We can afford to make those choices. And people living in poverty cannot. They've got to cut down the last trees in their desperation to get a bit more fertile land to grow a bit more food. And at the same time, they you know, fish the last fish for the same reason. In an urban area, they're going to buy the cheapest junk food. They don't have the luxury of making decisions like that, even though that food may actually be harming their health. They've got to survive. People will do almost anything to survive and women to feed their families. You talk about hope a lot. You, several of your books have the word hope in the title, including your upcoming book. Um, what's your message of hope for 2021 and beyond? Well, the message of hope is, first of all, we must admit and realize the full extent of the harm we've inflicted on this poor old planet. You know, this pandemic that's caused so much suffering, loss of jobs, um, economic chaos. We brought it on ourselves by our disrespect of animals in the natural world, creating conditions, crowded and stressed animals in wildlife um, markets, in factory farms, which make it relatively easy for a bacteria to jump from an animal to a person, or in this case, a virus. And that produces a new so-called zoonotic disease. And in fact, we're told 75% of all newly emerging human diseases are zoonotic in origin. So having, having realized the harm, climate change, the loss of biodiversity, people say to me all the time, do you really have hope? Well, my, my reasons for hope are quite simple. Back in 1991, I started a program for young people, Roots and Shoots. And it was in response to the fact that I was meeting young people all around the world 
who seemed to have lost hope, who were depressed, who were angry, mostly just apathetic, not seeming to care. And when I talked to them, they all said more or less the same, well, we feel like this because you've compromised our future and there's nothing we can do about it. Well, we have compromised the future of our young people. We've been compromising it, stealing it actually for years and years and years. But is it too late? I firmly believe, and I'm not alone, that we have a window of time. It's not a very big window. If we get together, then we can do something about it. So when the young people said there was nothing they could do about it, I thought, no, that's not right. So Roots and Toots began with 12 high schools, high school students in Tanzania. And they came to talk to me about all kinds of different problems, social, environmental, and what could, what, could, what could I do about it? I said, well, I, you know, I'm not a Tanzanian. You are. Go and find your friends who feel much the same. We had a meeting of about 30 people. And we decided that, uh, one, we would call this program Roots and Shoots. Secondly, that the main message was every one of us makes some impact on the planet every day. We can choose what sort of impact we make. And finally, that each group would choose three projects to make the world better, one for people, one for animals, one for the environment, because everything is interrelated. And so from that little beginning, and by the way, it started volunteerism in Tanzania. And it's interesting that, that all, but, all but two of that initial 12 were young men, and now I would say definitely there's more women than men in the Roots and Shoots groups. It's kind of fascinating. But anyway, um, many of these so-called developing countries start off with mostly boys and end up with mostly girls. Funny, isn't it? Anyway, um, it's now in over 60 countries. We've got members from kindergarten, university, everything in between. And they are changing the world. There's no question. They're my greatest reason for hope. The second reason is this extraordinary intellect. And we haven't always used it wisely, but science is beginning to come up with innovative new technologies, you know, all this renewable energy to help us live in greater harmony with Mother Nature. And we in our individual lives are beginning to think, how can I leave a lighter ecological footprint every day? And then there's the amazing resilience of nature. So places that have been destroyed, give them time and perhaps some help. And once again, nature will return. And they may not quite be the same as before, but they will support nature and biodiversity. And animals on the brink of extinction can be given another chance. And then finally, there's what I call the indomitable human spirit, the people who tackle what seems impossible and won't give up. And very often they succeed. And even if they don't, they will inspire others to carry on until that, their goal is achieved. How has women's equality changed since you started your career? Well, it depends on the country, but certainly in, in Europe and in the United States, although there's still a lot of gender inequality, Nevertheless, there are women in all, oh, just, just about every, every, every business, every, you know, they're everywhere. I mean, they, they can get into business, they can become engineers, they can become astronauts, they can dive deep in the, in the ocean. They can do things that it used to be thought only men could do. And so there's a huge change there, even though there's further to go. And Countries like Tanzania, in the rural areas, it's very, you know, it's very traditional. Still parts of Kenya and Ethiopia, there's female genital mutilation, although that's beginning to change. And we've had quite a major impact on this in Tanzania because it was when I was flying over the tiny Gombe National Park, where, by the way, we still study the chimps, it's, we just celebrated our 60th anniversary. And it was when I began in 60, it was part of a great equatorial forest belt stretching across Africa. 
but by the late 80s, when I flew over in a tiny plane, it was shocking. I was looking down at a very small island of forest surrounded by completely bare hills, clearly more people living there than the land could support, too poor to buy food from elsewhere, struggling to survive. And that's when it hit me. If we don't help these people find ways of making a living without destroying the environment, then we can't save chimps, forests, or anything else. And so the Jane Goodall Institute, JGI, we began a program called Take Care or Tukhari, which is our method of community-led conservation. And right from the start, there was no arrogant group of white people going into a poor African village and telling them what we were going to do to make their lives better. No. We started with the 12 villages around the boundary of Bombay and with a hand-picked group of seven local Tanzanians. None of them had PhDs, but they'd all worked in NGOs like forest free agriculture, and education, and so on. And they went into the villages and listened. Listen to the people. What can we do to help you make your lives better? Well, grow more food, please, and better health and better education. So that's where we started. And then as the people came to trust us, we could introduce water management programs. And then we started raising money for scholarships to keep girls in school, because it's been shown all around the world that as women's education improves, family size tends to drop. And we also provide family planning. And what's interesting is that even in these rural areas, people have access to the outside world through technology. And they want, they, they see education as a way of their children lifting themselves out of poverty. Well, the average number of children a woman was having was eight to 10 when I arrived, but they can't afford to educate that many children. It's not cheap. And so they were so welcoming of family planning. And even the men, that was a surprise to us, but they came and asked for vasectomies because they couldn't afford to keep more children. And uh, so we also introduced Mohammed Yunus's Grameen Bank, the microcredit opportunities. And that's particularly for women who tend to be the ones who pay back. The men tend to get all excited when they've been successful and go and drink with their buddies, you know, in, in the beer bars. But we've had almost all the borrowed money returned. And it is for a group to decide on their own environmentally sustainable small business, like a tree nursery, like a few chickens, something like that. And because it's, because it's not a, a gift handed out, you know, it's something they've earned when they pay the money back and they're proud of it. They've done it themselves. And I think that is just so important, a sense of pride and ownership. Amy and I are both located in Los Angeles and we are very excited for the upcoming exhibit at the Natural History Museum. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the exhibit Becoming Jane? I can tell you a bit, but I've never seen it. I was on my way to see it when the pandemic hit. So I've never actually seen it except virtually. But basically, it's uh, everybody who's been there loves it. And it sort of starts with my, with my career, my childhood. It gives a lot of information about chimps. It's fun for little kids because there's a lot of life-size um, models of, of chimpanzees. And some of them are sort of animated. And there's a little box where you go in and you can hear chimpanzee sounds. And then you're told, well, you know, you try and make the sound too. And if you make it well, you'll get a A or, you know, whatever. So uh, there's, I don't know, they've got a replication of the tent that mum and I shared when we first arrived at Gombe. They've got histories of the different chimpanzees and histories of some of the Tanzanian field workers who've helped us with the study. And I don't know what else, but people love it anyway. Well, we can't wait. We can't wait to go. We're so excited. 
Um, what's your dream for the young people who are involved with Roots and Shoots? Well, the dream is now reality because many of them, I, what I call our alumni, as we began with high school in 91, a lot of these are fully grown now. So we've not only got hundreds and thousands of young people actively in the program, but we've got all these people who've been through it. And the dream is that they will all become understanding of the problems that we've created, but be empowered, understand that they as individuals can make a difference. We have the Minister for Wildlife in Tanzania, and he was in Roots and Shoots in primary school. And he stood up to the recently deceased president who was building a dam in the middle of a World Heritage Site. And he stood up to him knowing the president had said, anyone who opposes me will go to jail or worse. But fortunately, he didn't lose his life. Of course, he lost his job. The Minister of Environment in Congo, he didn't have to confront somebody like that but he's very passionate about environmental regulations and punishing poachers and things. I go to China. People come up all the time and say, but of course I care about the environment now because I was in your Roots and Shoots program in primary school. And children are changing their parents. I've got many letters from parents who tell me, well, I never used to think about my shopping, but my kids made me. And so Roots and Toots, by partnering with other similar youth organizations with similar values. And one thing that's emerged from it is that whenever possible, we try to bring groups together. It's usually virtual, but we do try face to face. And they have just come to understand without being taught, it's not a part of Roots and Toots per se, that far more important than the color of your skin, your culture, your religion, your language, is the fact that we are all a human family. We all weep tears, we all laugh when we're happy, and we share emotions. And when we fall and cut ourselves, the blood is the same, it's proven the same. We are actually one family, and this is part of Roots and Shoots, and that's why I was made a messenger of peace by the UN. How has the COVID uh, pandemic impacted you personally? And what can we as humanity learn from this experience we've all been through? Well, what, what we can learn is that, as I've said, it was our disrespect of animals, crowding them in these places, hunting them, killing them, destroying the environment, forcing them closer contact with people, you know, we, we brought the pandemic on ourselves, no question. And um, it's our disrespect of the natural world that's led to climate change and loss of biodiversity too. But, you know, when, when Britain was closed down at the beginning of the pandemic, I, I've been grounded ever since. And at first I was frustrated and angry because I'm used to traveling 300 days a year around the world. Actually, although it's far more exhausting and more tired than any other time in my life, you can hear my voice gets tired, my eyes suffer, looking at screens all day. But the, the upside of it is I've reached literally millions more people, millions in many more countries than would have been possible had I been traveling. And so when traveling becomes possible again, I'll probably balance it a little bit more and do, you know, keep on with this Zoom outreach because it really it has made a huge difference. It's not the same as being in person. And the thing I found the hardest to do, but I had to do it because there's no point doing it otherwise. But if you're giving a lecture to five, 10,000 people in a big auditorium, there's this excitement in the air and there's a feedback. People laugh when you say something funny. And they, and they cry when it's sad. But now I have to give a lecture, looking at that little green spot on top of my laptop that's a camera lens, and there's no feedback. And that has been a difficult thing to master. But if you don't do that, you might as well not do it. 
That was another thing my mother taught me. If you're going to do something, do it properly. So one last question. Um, is, there, is there a particular moment in your journey of following your passions that you think might be most inspiring to the people who are watching? You know, there's a lot of different people listening with the different goals in mind. But I think, you know, the decision to save up money. I had to work in a hotel around the corner to get the fare to go out to Africa. And I read everything I could about African animals. There wasn't much written back then. And, you know, had the amazing luck of hearing about Lewis Leakey and being told if you're interested in animals, you should meet Lewis Leakey. And because I was kind of prepared with all the hard work I'd done, I could answer most of his questions. And anyway, and that there again, I was lucky to be a female because he felt that women would be better in the field, more patient. And that's why he chose three women, me, Baruti, and Diane and Fossey. And when I first got out to Tanzania, it was uh, just on the brink of independence. And the Tanzanian men, quite rightly, were, you know, they were not too friendly to a lot of white males. They'd been subjugated for so long. But a young girl and her mother, oh, we want to look after them. So, you see, being a woman has never harmed me, but I've been lucky. I know it's different for a lot of women who want to compete with men in the men's world, but I wasn't competing with any men. because There was nobody out there doing what I was doing. And even when I got to Cambridge, it was told I'd done it all wrong. Um, you know, it, I still wasn't trying to enter a, ma a man's world. I just had to convince them that their reductionist way of thinking was wrong. And I did that as I've done everything, not by confrontation, by telling them stories, stories about chimpanzees, the amazing things they do, telling them stories about dogs who've rescued people, telling them stories, you know, that's how I deal with people, trying to reach the heart. Because very often, especially when it was in those days, a young girl talking to a, you know, a dominant male, male male dominated society back then and they wouldn't have listened if i'd argued with them they'd have just said how oh, we're not going to listen to her but stories that's different you reach the heart well thank you so much you have reached so many hearts and especially ours and we are eternally grateful to you for spending some time with us today um, well, it's been a wonderful time thank you very much it's truly thank an so honor much. Thank you, Dr. Goodall, for accepting the Passionistas Persist Icon Award and taking the time to speak with us. Tonight is proof that if you follow your passions, you just might fulfill your lifelong dreams. We also wanna thank Margaret Cho and Selene Luna for joining us tonight and sharing their insights. Thank you to the other people who made tonight possible. Sarah Martin, the team at the Jane Goodall Institute, including Mary Lewis, Christopher Hildreth, Carmen Mullins, and Susana Binama, as well as Barry Snyder, John Ruggieri, and our producing partners for the night and the entire weekend, Selene Luna and Karen Herman. And thank you to everyone who's made this year's Passionistas Project Women's Equality Summit so special, including all of the panelists, moderators, and presenters. Thank you to our charitable partners, the Jane Goodall Institute, Jane Goodall's Roots and Shoots, Michelson Found Animals, Girls Inc., and Chicken and Egg Productions. We'd also like to thank our sponsors, Trizcom Public Relations, Tea Drops, Kaya Essentials, Her Legacy Women and Wealth, Quirk, Transformation Journeys Worldwide, Aaron's Coffee Corner, Aesthetica Mia, Go Confidently Coaching, and Dia Bondi. And we'd like to give a special thank you to our attorney, Annette Kaler. Thanks to our friends and family, including Beth Harrington, Lisa Barbosa, and Lee Harrington who have always inspired us to follow our passions. And an extra special thanks to Rob Johnson and Marvin Ezioni. We could not have done this without your encouragement and support. And most importantly, thank you to all of you in our Passionistas community for taking part in the summit and supporting other women worldwide. Please join our Passionistas Project Facebook group 
where we'll be continuing all of these conversations as we work together for equality for all women. Until next time, stay well and stay passionate.